Those who don't like Christopher Nolan's Memento all seem to think that it's a one-trick pony, a single gimmick that lasts almost two hours. As you may have guessed, because this is called Movies I Love, I personally don't think that the non-linear structure is a gimmick, but rather a clever storytelling device. But I also acknowledge that a movie needs to be more than a clever premise. A movie with a clever premise but bad execution usually ends up being a bad movie. Yeah. Plus, I admit that the story told in the reverse device isn't really anything new. Plenty of TV shows have done episodes in this fashion, including Star Trek Voyager, The X-Files, ER, even Seinfeld. But Memento is more than its non-linear structure. What its critics don't really give it credit for is the way it uses its premise to develop the characters in unique ways, and to examine themes that go beyond a simple revenge tale. With a story told out of order, a traceable character arc becomes very complicated because it's difficult to get a sense of how the characters change as the events unfold. But what's interesting about these characters is that, if you watch the film in chronological order, a version which you can find online, none of them really change much. I mean, at best you could say Leonard has sporadic mood swings. You feel angry, you don't know why. You feel guilty, you have no idea why. But that's hardly a character arc. But rather, watching the events in the order in which they're presented, it's not the characters that change, but our perception of them. And that's what defines their arcs. Take Leonard Shelby, for instance. Rather than just sporadic mood swings, you can trace an arc when looking at his behavior in the order of the film. He begins as this determined man on a noble mission. Me? Yeah. I got a reason. At first, he's defensive about his condition. Just because there are things I don't remember doesn't make my actions meaningless. The world doesn't just disappear when you close your eyes, does it? And he believes that he's just as capable of tracking down the killer or someone with a functioning memory. I don't they know. collect facts. That's not what I'm they make notes and they draw conclusions. Facts, not memories. But we later learn that he can be frustrated by his handicap. She's gone. And the present is trivia, which I scribbled down as fucking notes. And he can be taken advantage of, whether he knows it or not. What happened? Until finally he admits how helpless he really is. You know the truth about my condition, officer? You don't know anything. Now I know, you fake it. If you think you're supposed to recognize somebody, you just pretend to. You bluff it to get a pat on the head from the doctors. And ultimately, we learn that he is not the noble man out for justice that we saw in the first scenes. You're John G. So you can be my John G. Far from it. I think the reverse chronological presentation makes Natalie a much more interesting character, too. She seems very sweet at first. Making jokes. Must be tough living your life according to a couple of scraps of paper. You mix your laundry list with your grocery list and you'll end up eating your underwear for breakfast. Giving Leonard helpful information, and even coyly hinting at an intimate relationship with Leonard. Mm. Oh, are you still staying at the discount in room 304? Left it at my place. The next time we see her, these initial impressions are reinforced. Did you sleep okay? And she seems extremely vulnerable and sympathetic when she comes back from her meeting with Dodd. Fuck Leonard, Dodd. Dodd beat the shit out of me which is heavily contrasted by her next scene, where we see her true colors. Maybe your cunt of a fucking wife sucked one too many diseased cocks and turned you into a fucking retard. It's appropriate that between the scenes of Natalie and her most sympathetic, this guy, this guy is so dangerous, let's just think of something else, okay? And Natalie at her most evil, pathetic piece of shit. The black and white sequence depicts Leonard in this frustrated state, confused about whether or not to trust the caller. I find the timing of this casting to be very intriguing. Keep in mind that Memento is only a year after The Matrix, where Carrie Ann Moss played the trustworthy heroine and Joe Pantoliano played the double-crossing villain. I think that may have deceived audiences when Memento first came out, and they were prepared to implicitly trust Natalie and be wary of Teddy. You are full of shit. Teddy is a... divisive character. The first thing we learn about him is that he may or may not have killed Leonard's wife. I finally found him. How long have I been looking? Come on, let's go down to the basement. Let's go down, you and me together. Then you'll know who you really are. But regardless, he villainously taunts Leonard. You don't have a clue, you freak. So whether you believe he's the killer or not, he doesn't give us a whole lot of reason to like him right off the bat. But outside of that, he seems pretty friendly and supportive. Lenny! He tries to cheer Leonard up when he gets down. He destroyed my ability to live. You living? And he helps him out with the Dodd problem. But keeping in mind his first scene, it's hard to know what to make of this behavior. When he offers Leonard advice, the audience isn't sure if he's doing it to help or if he's doing it to manipulate Leonard. I'm not lying. Take my pen. Write this down. Do not trust her. What we saw in the first scene and what we've seen since is in conflict, so we can't know for sure which it is. Heck, I still don't really know which it is. In the end, we learn that he is conniving and manipulative, but does he have noble intentions? I believed you. I thought you deserved a chance for revenge. 
I mean, he's, in a way, helping Leonard with this seriously messed up cathartic therapy. Come on, you got your revenge. Enjoy it while you still remember. And I guess you could argue that there's a vigilante aspect by taking on a drug dealer. But at the same time, he's profiting from it. Jimmy's your guy. I just figured we'd make a few dollars on the side. And more importantly, he's enabling a serial killer. Cheer up. There's plenty of John G's for us to find. Personally, I just call him a morally gray character and leave it at that. Regardless of your opinions of Teddy or Natalie, it's interesting how our perceptions of them change once we know the whole story. For example, if you believe that Teddy is the John G based on the opening scene, this seems like a really dastardly thing to say. Well, then we'll get the best. But knowing that he's not, that line becomes very supportive. Or how about this kiss? At first, it seems sweet and even a little heartbreaking. I'm sorry. But if you know the whole story, or if you watch the film chronologically, maybe even lovers, you realize this is a horribly, horribly messed up thing to do on her part. <laughs> These revisions of perception are only possible through the nonlinear structure, which is why I think it adds to the story. Before I go into how else I think it adds to the story, I need to answer one question. What really happened to Leonard's wife? Did she die in the attack, or did Leonard inadvertently kill her with insulin? Let me start by saying, yes, I think this is supposed to be open-ended. That being said, after watching this movie at least a dozen, maybe two dozen times, I'm more inclined to defend the second theory, and here's why. Leonard makes a point to say over and over how Sammy Jenkins should have been able to learn by conditioning. All the previous cases responded to conditioning, Sammy didn't respond at all. And to point out that he is able to learn from conditioning. Conditioning didn't work for Sammy, so he became helpless. But it works for me. There's evidence to suggest that Leonard has learned things since his accident. For example, look how well he handles the gun after his injury, compared to how inept and feeble he is before his injury. Or just on a practical level, every time his memory resets, he still knows that his wife is dead, which obviously isn't something he knew before his accident. Like you told yourself over and over again, conditioning yourself to remember. If he can condition himself to learn how to use a gun or to know that his wife is dead, I'm convinced he can condition himself to believe that his wife wasn't diabetic. She wasn't diabetic? I think I don't know my own wife? and to project that onto his memory of Sammy Jenkins. The torment and, and pain and anguish tearing her up inside. The insulin. He says himself he's not to be trusted. Because of my condition, you don't believe someone with this condition? And if that wasn't enough, look at all the visual clues. When looking at his tattoo of Sammy Jenkins, there's a quick cut to an insulin needle, which is obviously Leonard giving his wife an injection because the identical shot is used later. This could be Leonard remembering the actual story of Sammy, i.e. his own story. Most people seem to catch this glimpse of Sammy in the hospital turning into Leonard, suggesting that Leonard is actually Sammy in the stories that he tells. Now that that's all cleared up, sort of, it brings me to the point. Reality versus perception of reality. To Leonard, the reality is that his wife died in the attack, and he is living to avenge her. Is this true? Well, it's true to him. You don't want the truth. You make up your own truth. That's the reality that he's choosing to live. When I heard that Christopher Nolan began writing Inception while filming Memento, it made total sense to me. At the end of Inception, the spinning top is irrelevant. Cobb walks away from the top to be with his kids, because he doesn't care if it falls. The fact that he is with his kids is enough for him, even if it's a dream. The line early in the film foreshadows this. The dream has become the reality. Who are you to say otherwise? <laughs> dream or not, this has become Cobb's reality, because it's the reality that he is choosing. Just like Leonard, who's choosing to live in a reality where he is nobly avenging his wife's death and not the cause of it. Leonard claims that truth exists outside of his own perception. I have to believe in a world outside my own mind. I have to believe that my actions still have meaning, even if I can't remember them. I have to believe that when my eyes are closed, the world's still there. But he contradicts this claim by writing down Teddy's license plate. He knows that in the world outside of his own mind, Teddy didn't kill his wife but he chooses to make that the reality in his mind. Do I lie to myself to be happy? In your case, Teddy. Yes, I will. Then again, with Teddy dead and his police report missing pages, there's no one left alive to provide a different account of what actually happened to Leonard's wife. Leonard now believes irrefutably that Teddy killed her and had to be brought to justice. Who are we to say otherwise? I don't think they'd let someone like me carry a gun. I fucking hope not.